everybody, and welcome to That Startup Show. I'm Ray Johnston, running the show solo tonight in the absence of Benjamin Law. Is this some sort of sign? Should we consider renaming ourselves That Stop Down Show? <laughs> the rhetorical answer is... Maybe. But before the haters get too excited, hi haters, not sure why you're watching, but hi anyway, I'm actually referring to one of this episode's themes. When things go, well, a little haywire and even end in a burnout. Sounds cool, doesn't it? A burnout's a thing your dad did when he was 19 in his FJ Holden in a Coles car park. Or you could do it in a Tesla S just so the bloody thing makes a noise. <laughs> But in startup world, it's more like lying in a puddle of tears on your bedroom floor, Googling one way end of the world Antarctic doom retreat. Because let's face it, being the next Mark Zuckerberg isn't easy, especially when you're not the next Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> According to the Startup Genome Report, at least nine in 10 startups will fail. But that doesn't mean that you should try to make the other nine companies collapse. That is not a productive use of your time. <laughs> time. Remember that? See, burnout can happen to entrepreneurs or anyone when they work more than the normal 80-hour work week. You know you're in burnout mode when you start downloading all the meditation apps onto your phone and then start deleting them because they're taking up too much space on your phone. <laughs> It could be that moment where you not only realise your dream project has turned into a nightmare, but you also get a nasty wakey-wakey from mum to remind you that it's your Year 12 English exam and you forgot to read the novels, and you've been asleep in the exam room, and you're nude and on fire. <laughs> We've all been there. All jokes aside, conflict inside a company and inside yourself is a serious topic and one we don't often talk about for many reasons. So, of course, we're going to talk about it later with our excellent panel. And if you've got a story that you want to share, please jump on social media, people. TSU show and hashtag that startup show. You know the drill. But now, it is time to cross to our audience correspondent and resident YouTuber Jessica Holzman, aka Study with Jess, who will be giving us some great life hacks on basically becoming better people. Hey there, Jess. How's the turnout? And is there any burnout? Thanks, Ray. Awesome to be here. Now, I feel like I have my wellness routine pretty down packed, but I'm always up for fine tuning it. And I know that everyone's different. So I'm gonna use our amazing audience here today to brainstorm some different life hacks to avoiding burnout in the startup space. And we've got quite a good list going on here. And I have my amazing assistant as well. So you're gonna help me with, yeah, what do we have here? Here's our starting point, okay. First one is start with tweeting in bed. Really? Really, really, Sneak? Okay. Next tip for avoiding burnout, do not take my phone ever. Who's writing these guys? <laughs> Next, kill it, crush it 24-7. <clears throat> More coffees and what pot plant? Okay, I feel like we need to regroup and um, go over this one more time. So while we're doing that, it's back to you, Ray. Thanks, Jess. We'll catch up with you soon. Burnout. It's that time when you just can't switch off when you're not at work. You're at family dinner and you start talking about having seconds as closing a series B round. <laughs> Brushing your teeth becomes a tooth hack. You talk about going to the toilet as making a successful exit. And Netflix and chill means binge second screening TEDx talks at double speed. Helping us avoid burning out are three people who know the game. Our first guest is working on machine systems that help reduce stress in the office. So, the opposite of photocopiers. She's also the founder of a business called Execs with Soul. Talk about smashing stereotypes. Please welcome the CEO of Pioneera, Danielle Owen Whitford. <laughs> Welcome. 
Our next guest is CEO, chairman and founder of Zendesk, a global company that builds software helping more than 125,000 organisations around the world better work with their customers. He's also the author of the book Startup Land. You know what? He should go on that startup show. I forget its name. You know the one. Please welcome Mikkel Svein. some Mikkel fans in the audience tonight. And our final guest has done everything from hosting ABC Radio to running her own yoga retreat to working with vulnerable clients in prisons to creating mindfulness programs for Google and Facebook to appearing in a giant lotto ball costume. Just the once, though. <laughs> She's program director for Blue Chili's newest Accelerator, a regional startup program called Accelerate, and is the founder and CEO of Mindful Under Fire. Please welcome Megan Flamer. <laughs> welcome. Now, as is customary, we're going to start with a big question. What is burnout and why does it happen? Burnout can be a lot of different things. Um, it can be overwhelm. I think it can be taking on too much. It's, it's usually the point in the road where something forces a stop. You know, burnout is where the legs come out from underneath you and you just can't do any more, um, whatever that point is. I mean, it's a really individual thing. For someone, it, it might be a death in a family. For someone else, it might be, you know, their business isn't going well. So. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of different things. What would you say it is? Yeah, so I, um, if you look at the medical terms, they tend to talk about burnout when stress becomes chronic. So it's chronic in the body. Your adrenaline is such a high level that your body actually can't cope with it anymore. So it starts to shut down. And so physically you see things start to happening to your you know, your health physically. Uh, mentally, you start to withdraw, you start to isolate yourself because you just don't have the energy to connect with people anymore. And it's literally like a candle going out. Your body just starts to shut down. And that's really when you're getting to that burnout stage. Wow, what about your experiences? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that, that you're probably burning out at the point where it's hard to deal with the constant pace of change and ambiguity. Um, and, and, you know, like, because to some extent we all kind of, you know, we like to new, have new challenges and so on. But at some point, if you have new challenges every single day and they increase in speed every single day, you know, there's definitely a chance that you can, you can burn out. Well, there you have it. Now, we're going to throw to something fun now, a bit of a change of pace. Each time that we do that startup show, we like to have a quiz. And this time, we've created a game called Time Out. We all know that one of the keys to avoiding burnout is to have interests outside of your business. It's really important. So I'm going to give you the name of a tech CEO and you have to tell me what their favourite pastime is, besides doing laps in their swimming pools full of cash, <laughs> which I assume they're all doing all the time. So, first, let's test our buzz buzzers. Mikkel? <laughs> Danielle? <laughs> and Megan? <laughs> nice. All right, we are buzzing people. Let's quiz. What is the hobby of Sandy Lerner of Cisco Systems? Is it A jousting, B, baking cupcakes, or C, using a flamethrower to create wood burn art? I, I reckon it's wood burning art. You're going to go with the art? Yes, yeah, C. The answer is actually A, jousting. She has custom armour, I'm not making this up, and even breeds shire horses on her ranch. She puts the land in Lansing. <laughs> Next up, we've got Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter and Square. Is his hobby A, square dancing, B, <laughs> recording bird sounds, or C, sewing? <laughs> I'm going to say square dancing because square's got to come from somewhere. That does make a lot of yeah. sense. 
going logical. Unfortunately, it's not correct. <laughs> the answer is actually sewing. And Dorsey was fired from Twitter in 2008 for focusing too much on outside hobbies, like his sewing classes. <laughs> Seriously, let's face it, you know, sewing was the pre-internet version of Twitter, mindlessly passing time and occasionally doing a bit of a stitch up. <laughs> Next on our list is Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. Does he spend his spare time, A, whitewater rafting, B, skiing, or C, building a 10,000-year clock? <laughs> He's building a clock. He is building a clock. <laughs> <laughs> now, he's not personally building the clock with his you know, bare hands, but he is the chief investor on the project and it's on his land, which is in a mountain. It ticks once a year and the minute hand moves around every century and a cuckoo comes out once a millennium. <laughs> this is all very, very real. You can look this up, I promise you. Bezos is planning to be awoken from his cryogenic slumber after the 10,000 years to explain to the Amazon <laughs> robots who have taken over Earth what a cuckoo is. <laughs> Next, we have Steve Wozniak of Apple. What does he do in his spare time? Is it A, baking, B, playing Segway polo, or C, writing the blog Fake Steve Jobs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say uh, baking because apple, apple pie. Baking would make a lot of sense, but mm. the answer is actually B, Segway no. polo. Oh. <laughs> Does it even exist? Is there such a thing? It does exist, yeah. and the championship trophy <laughs> is called the Woz Cup in his honour. <laughs> Unfortunately, things haven't gone so well in his expansion into Segway jumps racing, though. <laughs> Next, we have Ginny Rometty of IBM. Does she spend her time, A, scuba diving, B, finger painting, or C, writing Harry Potter erotica? <laughs> I think scuba diving. I hope scuba yeah. diving. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Finally, we have a regular answer and it is scuba yeah. diving. Yes. <laughs> Maybe it's why IBM is called Big Blue. <laughs> that is the end of the game, though. You've all done so well and the scores are around here somewhere, I'm very sure. But now it's time for the pitch ring. <laughs> Welcome to The Pitch Ring. This is where we meet three keen entrepreneurs who will be bearing their souls, their souls of their startups with us. Tonight's winner will not only go into our season grand finale with a chance to win genuinely huge prizes, but will also take home the coveted prize, which proves they are the Australian version of the unicorn, the Unaroo. <laughs> It's a trophy that doubles as both a paperweight and nightmare fuel. <laughs> Seriously, you do not want to meet this girl in the outback. <laughs> Tonight, we've chosen three incredible startups who are committed to making a difference in solving workplace stress and mental health. Our panel will be judging the ideas on originality, marketability, scalability, and the purity of their immortal souls. <laughs> the rules are simple. Rule number one, you have a maximum of two minutes. Rule number two, at 30 seconds to go, you'll hear this sound. Rule number three, no overtime. We will not allow you to eat into your me time. <laughs> now, our first pitcher has been to the gates of startup hell and returned with a business to help turn others around at the smell of brimstone. Please welcome Sandy Buchanan. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sandy from Limba. Three years ago, I started a restaurant. We managed to raise capital, have thousands of customers, great reviews. Sounds awesome, right? Well, there was a lot of challenges. And during the tough times, I didn't really know where to turn, who to talk to. And to be honest, I felt alone. I felt scared at times. What I needed then is what we're building now, and that's Limba. Limba provides modern well-being services for modern workplaces. Through the Limba app, 
you can access multiple levels of support. The core level of support is the Limba Decelerator, which is workshops run by expert facilitators. It focuses on debunking the myths that exist around entrepreneurship, such as raising heaps of capital equals instant success, or I've worked heaps and heaps of hours, that's really good. At these workshops, you're able to connect with other entrepreneurs, share stories, common experiences. You're also able to learn knowledge and tips around well-being and mental health. As well as that, Limba also offers customizable well-being policies that you can publicize, educational materials that you can access online that are evidence-based, referral pathways for coaching and therapy. But the thing is, two out of three people who currently suffer from mental ill health never seek treatment. So before we get to that point, we need to make sure that these steps and levels are doing a lot more. Evidence shows that social support and education are key drivers in the battle against stigma. So Limba is providing a product with multiple levels of evidence-based support that is proactive rather than reactive, that's engaging, supportive and social. Through giving more choice and convenience, we can make sure that good mental health is accessible and socially acceptable. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sandy. Megan, did you have any questions? Ooh. Ah, yeah. How are you intervening early? How are you measuring that? Early intervention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really good point. So what we do is we work with organisations or individuals and we go in and we get a baseline metric. So we do that by understand, we speak with individuals within the organisation or the entrepreneurs themselves and run them through a survey. And then we understand exactly where they're at. And then I guess in terms of, so we get a, a baseline understanding of what we need to do within the, within the organisation. But then we're offering more proactive services rather than reactive. So early intervention comes through people knowing that there's an environment where they can take that first step and they can actually talk to well-being champions, which is something that we're developing within the group. And it's really just giving people the confidence to know that they can talk and that they can take that first step. So that's how we're addressing early intervention, yeah. Nicole, did you have a question? Um, this is the first pitch I've ever heard where you haven't talked about money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good for well-being. How are you going to make yeah. money? Really good question. So we're running a subscription-based model where entrepreneurs or founders and they're the people that work within their organisation. They pay a subscription and then they get access to a baseline level of care. Um, and then we also have programs, so the Decelerator program, which is uh, you can have drop-in sessions with your subscription or you can have a more extensive program which comes at an additional cost. It obviously has great benefits. We also have referral fees, so every time someone is referred to our platform, they're able, we're able to get a small amount of that as well. Yeah. Danielle, did you have any questions? Yeah, oh, well done. Thanks. Um, how are people going to be able to find you? How are you going to bring customers on board? Totally, yeah. Well, I guess our early marketing strategy is going to, is targeting people through communities. So we work currently with Inspire9, and through their channels, we're able to offer our support services. People learn about Limber and what we're doing but they're also able to go out there and become evangelists for us. So it's quite a tight-knit community, the entrepreneurial space, as I'm sure you guys know. So if something works, if something resonates with people, they talk. And so through providing a service that's unique, that's effective, and that's really needed, we're, able, we're hoping that we'll be able to access that community and um, make a real difference, yeah. Please join me in thanking Sandy. We've still got two more pictures to come, but let's check up on the wellness of our audience. How are they doing, Jess? We've been doing really well, thanks, Ray. We've actually been meditating on it and the ideas are just flowing right now. We are so in that zone. And I really liked the most recent tip, Tanique, what did it say? It said, let your blender do the chewing for you. Honestly, sounds efficient, sounds healthy to me. And um, speaking of blenders, what? We happen to have one right here on set. 
So I thought we would nourish our audience brains, because that sounds super appetizing, with one of my favorite healthy smoothies. And I was thinking that we're gonna call this smoothie the Beating the Startup Blues. What do you guys think of that? Good. Yeah. Okay, so Tanique, I'll get you to pop in all the ingredients and pop the blender on. So we have blueberries. Now, it's pretty simple ingredients here, but you can add whatever else you like to it. We've got some yogurt. Almond milk. Because we're feeding so many people, I say we just pour all of that in there. Nice. And then the last ingredient is going to be some honey. Just make it a little bit sweeter. And my mum's going to be happy because she has her very own beehive at home. So, love the bees, love our honey. And now let's just pop that lid on and get it started. Go for it. It's so peaceful. It's like waterfalls yeah. and it's so zen. It's like the stress melt away with the sound of the calming ocean. Good. Yeah, I'm feeling relaxed. Okay, brain food served. Um, back to you, Ray. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Save me a smoothie, yeah? You're watching that startup show, I assume. If not, why not? Come on, eyes this way. Thank you. <laughs> Our next picture is fighting against bullying. No, that sounds too violent. Combating <laughs> No. We need some new words, people. Please welcome Rosie Thomas. <laughs> My name is Rosie and I'm from Project Rocket. So my sister and I started Project Rocket when we were pretty fresh out of high school. And that's because we were so sick and tired of seeing bullying like destroy the lives of our peers and yet no one was doing it, anything about it in a way that actually reached young people. And so even though we had zero business experience, but a lot of audacity, we started Project Rocket, Australia's youth driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. So back then in 2006, we like came up with this new idea for what we wanted to see in the world. And it was this. We believe in a world where kindness and respect thrive over bullying, hate and prejudice, and all young people are free to realise their potential. So bullying robs young people of their potential, right? Like horrendously, suicide is the leading cause of death among young Australians, which is so messed up. So now more than ever, we need to be creating spaces in schools, especially where young people are safe and supported. So that's what we've been doing for the last 12 years. At Project Rocket, we send really passionate, highly trained young people into schools all over Australia to teach other young people how to stand up. We've positively impacted now over 300,000 young people. To scale that kind of impact, we've custom built an online platform called Project Rocket Online that makes our workshops available anywhere with an internet connection. It's been hailed by industry experts as a first in the fight against bullying, and we're pretty proud of it. Uh, I think what's missing from so many of the other programs out there is this youth perspective, which really is what's so important when we're actually talking about issues like cyberbullying and sexting. So Project Rocket fills that gap in education. But we knew that we could do more, so last year we partnered with Google to create Project Rocket TV. Bite-sized episodes that talk about the tough stuff you don't get to talk about at school. And now as like the kids, we have like a seat at the international table. We now serve on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter's global safety councils. So where to next? Project Rocket is more than just a debt-free, profitable social enterprise. We are a vehicle for social change. And it's always been my belief that that's what business should really be about. So. I guess we want your support. We want it really badly. We want to be in every single Australian school and beyond. So tell your teacher mates, your parent mates, um, all of the young people in your lives to join the Project Rocket movement. Help us build a world where kindness and respect can thrive over bullying, hate and prejudice. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. And your energy is incredible. Um, I just, how quickly can you scale this? Because I'd love to see this in every school, everywhere. How quickly can you get to everyone? So, Danielle, we've been like pretty hard at it, as you can imagine. So, we have been doing this for 12 
years. I feel like Project Rocket sort of raised me, but it's really picked up since we've started digital and we've also started finding loads of other young people that can deliver the workshops. So as I said, we currently have impacted 300,000, but the actual online platform has the capacity to influence hundreds of thousands more. As I mentioned before as well, because we're creating these influence offshore, there's opportunities for us to really like license the content, create more digital programs and really, I guess, take the model and the approach that we've been refining over the last 12 years and roll it out on a global stage. Sadly, it is a global issue um, and it takes, you know, a group effort, I guess. Thank what about you, Megan? Megan? I noticed you have some pretty high profile supporters because I was stalking you on Twitter today and I noticed that Monica Lewinsky was supporting the cause. Is that part of the strategy that you guys are working on or has that just been organic support? Yeah, um, Megan, we are so lucky at Project Rocket to have um, lots of support from lots of different people. As I said, we have been at it for a really long time um, and it's amazing to have the support of Monica Lewinsky, but actually for us, the young people that we serve are the stars of the show. Um, we have the best jobs in the world. We get to see them every day being their best, digging deep and creating a better world. So we want to platform them um, as, the, as the front runners in these conversations. But having said that, like it really is these relationships we've been building, particularly for the last six years in the landscape changing as our lives spill online with social media platforms that allowed us to not only scale our reach, but build some lucrative partnerships that can help us build more products and reach schools that can't afford to pay because we are for profit. What are your thoughts on Project Rocket, Mikkel? It's a beautiful project. Congratulations, Rosie. Thank you, Mikkel. Um, maybe one question could be like, how would you ultimately measure success? Mm. Well, that, as a social enterprise, that's always like the secret source of what you do. Um, and we want to create positive, lasting change. As I said, we have been refining our approach and we've been trying and testing it in a number of different settings. Um, recently, we had the Western Sydney University do an external evaluation of Project Rocket Online. And they found that before completing Project Rocket Online, only 49% of young Aussies felt confident enough to stand up to cyberbullying. But after completing the program, that figure rose to 96%. Um, the, the program that we've built also has this incredible ability that our presenters sadly can't do within a workshop, and that's capture data. We capture data on a group level, and we're able to track all sorts of amazing learnings around how young people are using social media, the choices that they make around their values, as well as bullying scenarios, and teachers can access that in real time in a reports database. So, we, um, yeah, we are measuring ourselves in many different ways, but that is always the big, big question for a social enterprise. Would you please thank Rosie, everybody? So folks, let's get stuck into issues around when things don't go quite to your perfect business plan. Mikkel, you wrote Startup Land. So what is Startup Land? And how are the roller coasters? <laughs> Um, so Startup Land is, is both a physical location, uh, Silicon Valley, San Francisco, but it's also a mental state. Um, and, and like once you enter Startup Land, it's, 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 it's hard to get out of it, but it's also a fascinating journey um, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, something that, you know, it, I think it's a privilege to try to go through that. And I think everybody who has kind of tried to be in a startup or made a startup or made a business of their own, it's, it's a fantastic feeling. Uh, you will probably fail, but nevertheless, you will have a fantastic journey. Fantastic. Now, Megan, you've spent some time in the heart of Silicon Valley. Is it a world that kind of breeds stress? And how do we stop the glorification of crunch culture coming out of there? Oh, this is one of my big bugbears. Um, you stop glorifying it by stopping glorifying it. I mean, I... I wish it were sort of some other magic bullet, but it's like we start so many conversations with, oh, yeah, I'm so busy and it's so hard and we wear that like a badge of honour. What if we started having different conversations around it and having different conversations with our friendship groups, with our families and, and in our companies as well? Um, I think... I think it is a, a real crunch culture and I think that people do really glorify it all the time, you know, how many hours you work in a week and that it has to be done that way. Um, I'm really excited to be back in Australia and working on programs in Australia and New Zealand where they're starting to come up in a different way and people are recognising that maybe this isn't worth costing all of my relationships and, um, you know, <laughs> no. my health and well-being. Yeah, and, yeah. and building it in a, in a different way. Um, 
but I, you know, I think having those conversations in a different way is is probably one of the, the very first steps that we can take. Um, and stopping people as they say it, it's like, hey, you you do seem like you are too busy. What can we do about that? How can we take something off your plate? How can you delegate a bit more? Have you had enough sleep? Yeah. When was the last time you ate? And just building those conversations and, and flexing that muscle more. I think I need to hear this tonight. This is good. <laughs> Tony, you're using algorithms to help people deal with stress before they even know that they need to, which is pretty cool. What are some of the warning signs? So we're using what the medical profession has used for decades in helping people understand what's going on. So basically language and behaviour. And Megan said it before, people talk about how busy they are, how stressed they are. So we're looking for words within organisation that indicate stress. So words like helpless, hopeless, worthless, phrases like here we go again, I'm too stretched, I don't want to do this anymore. So once we see those signs, then we can, in, we can intervene early because at that point you're still at the point where you can do something. Thing. You can take a break, you can go for a walk, you can have a chat to a friend, you can, you know, shut your laptop literally and have a bit of time out. So you're at that point where you can do something. When it gets chronic and you get to the burnout stage, it becomes a lot harder to do something. So we're wanting to actually help people prevent the burnout by taking the step that they need to and starting to allow their body to self-regulate. Our bodies are pretty amazing when we allow it to do what it needs to do. So just taking that breath and to self-regulate and the words give us the indication to do that. Nice. Now, I was wondering if you could share one of your own stories of a tough time and how you overcame it. You know, working yourself to death, the clues in the name, it's not good for us, it's not good for the company, so why do we do it? <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it is wanting it all. You yeah. know, we have this idea that I can have everything, I can have the relationship, I can have a great family life, I can be super healthy and, and super fit and I can have loads of money. You know, we chase that and I think that's exciting for people and that is an aspiration. Um, but I think we also get really attached that it looks a particular way, mm -hmm. that it looks exactly this way and if it doesn't look that exact way, then I've failed. And I think when we can start to change the conversation around it, and again, like I, I love the, the language piece of it because how we talk about it, how we talk about ourselves, how we talk about our circumstances can really change the perspective. So, for example, if I'm talking about all these things that are happening to me, people are dumping work on me, I'm a victim of all of those circumstances. There's all these bits and pieces that are happening to me and I can't cope. Whereas if I'm stopping and saying, well, do I have to do this right now? Does it have to look this way? Can we ship this presentation in a different way? Could we just do it halfway, you know, ship it before it's perfect? Um, having those conversations in different ways and, and externalising them, like actually having the conversations with the team and saying, I'm freaking out, like this is too much right now. Who can take something off my plate? The moment that you have that conversation with another person is the moment that it shifts and they can provide some perspective and you can work something out that maybe doesn't look exactly what, what you thought but it could still be something amazing. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, Mikkel? <laughs> well, I think you can, uh, I think as a person, you can do a lot more than you think. Mm -hmm. And I, if you want to do great things in life, it's going to take a lot of, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to be stressful. <laughs> it's going to be sacrifices. It's going to hurt. Uh, so like, uh, but you know, as you, you know, go through this journey, of course you need to find balance in your life because you can't continue like that and, and, and you know, as you set your side higher every single day, like you need to find stuff you can leave behind because you can't carry all your luggage with you. Um, but like we also need to embrace that, you know, I think it is important to, to do great things. You, 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 it, it does require hard work. Have you found that balance in your life? Oh my God, is it? <laughs> I would love to say yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm clearly the, you know, calm, centred person you see in front of you, but it's... I know, it's I was going to say, you seem to have it all together. No, just tonight. Um, but no, no, it, look, it, it changes. Every moment, it's a little bit different. I, when I think that I've got a handle on it, then something changes. And I think 
particularly if you're going into startup land, you put a lot of pressure on yourself to be successful because you think you can be successful. I think it's a bit like a marriage. No one goes into it expecting to get divorced. I know nine out of 10 startups fail, but I choose not to think about that. Um, you don't go into a startup expecting it to fail. So you really want to work very hard and make it work. So it, it shifts and changes. Um, I think to Mikhail's point, as you go on the journey, you start to see the things that are signs for you. So I'm starting to get much better at noticing the signs and listening to the people around me. I have a 12 year old daughter called Indy. She'll be very excited to hear her name mentioned on TV and my son Baxter, because he'll get upset if I don't say his name. Um, and she calls me on it. So when she sees me start working like a demon and ordering them around the house, she'll come and stand next to me and say, Mum, are you going to work like this? So she's like my real life pioneer that calls me and I go, actually, breathe, no, I'm not going to work like this. So using those support systems around you and looking for your own signs is what's worked for me. How do we be those support systems for the people around us? You know, if we're looking at someone who is clearly at risk of burnout, especially if they don't want to admit that they're struggling, uh, you know, how do you help them? And, and are people scared to be vulnerable? And especially women in startups as well. There's a lot of, a lot of prongs to this question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think absolutely. I think people are scared to be vulnerable full stop, men and women for different reasons. I think particularly in startup land because there's such a lack of women in technology and there's so much pressure to get more women in technology and then you bring women into technology like me and then there's a lot of pressure to perform. So it's pressure, pressure, pressure. Because you're performing on behalf of all of your gender. Oh my God, I'm bringing the whole human <laughs> women race with me, which is awesome, it's fantastic. But then there's a lot of pressure to perform. Yeah. So I think definitely. And I think whilst the conversation socially around mental health is happening, I still think there's a stigma associated with it and that makes people very vulnerable. We are in large organisations all the time and we interview users all the time about our products. And one of the things they say to us is, I'm really pleased you want to help me because I want the help, but please don't show my data to my boss mm. because I don't want my boss to think that I can't cope yeah. because then I'll be discriminated against. And, you know, I, can't, I get it because that may be what happens. So I do think people find it very difficult to talk about. Finding the people around you that you can trust, either within your workplace or outside of your workplace, I think is pretty important. And realising that it's okay to talk to someone. I think we internalise a lot. That was my problem. I internalised everything until crash and burn time. And then I realised to have one or two people you can really trust and be vulnerable with, and that helps significantly. If you are that person that is trusted, that someone is turning to, what can you do to help them? Well, I think from an organisational perspective, uh, like you have, to, you have to build a structure, you have to build an organisation that supports people's work-life balance, you know, and it's important that people have a full life. Mm. You know, you don't want people in your organisation that only can figure out working because then they build terrible skills for, you know, relationships. Um, but what you want to do is like if when everybody goes through their faces with personal issues or a lot of stress and all these things. And like, I think the best solution is always to, like people have to find out a way of building a team where they can, you know, have people rise, you know? So you can, so you have a chance to step back when you need to and can have other people rise that can take over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the beauty of, of, of building teams, you know, that people, if they get the opportunity, they want to do more and they want to show their, uh, value and they want to get their chance and like this is a perfect opportunity give them a little push and you know they'll figure it out. <laughs> now, there is a lot of pressure placed on startups to just keep swimming I'm looking at you Dory regardless of the reality of what's going on around them but does there come a point when you should just walk away? Keep swimming is important when you're building a company. It is important. Um, finding when to say stop is almost impossible. And that's the dilemma of building a startup is that one side of it, you struggle and you know you're not going to succeed. The other side of you know that, you know, you believe so hard in what you're doing. So finding that balance where you say stop is, is almost impossible. But like if you're not in a good place anymore, you know, and, you know, I don't know how to quantify that. If you don't feel like you're in a good place, walk away. You know, there's something else out there. And how do we stop founders feeling like a business failure is a personal failure? Yeah, especially when you've put so much of yourself into it and when it's played out in public. How do, how do we stop people feeling that way? I, I think 
That's, I mean, it's a hard one to do, but it's also one of the things... So I'm, I'm in charge of an accelerator program at the moment, and it's one of the things we're baking in with really early-stage startups for that exact reason. Like, you are not your company. Your company is something that's trying to solve a particular problem, and you may go on to run seven other companies. You might go on to be the CEO of a billion other things. This is just one aspect that you're trying, and we can look at all of the data of, you know, maybe your seventh startup will be the one that works. That doesn't make you a failure, it just means that you're learning how to do it better. So I think, again, the language around it, the way we have those conversations, creating that separation, and then my other big one is meditating, is a great way to create that separation. If you're able to step back, and I like what you said about having other people around you, having a community that can encourage you to step back, take that breath and have that perspective and recognise, like, is it such a big deal? Yeah, you put a lot of time and effort into it. You learned a lot. And on to the next thing. There will be something else that you can do and, and succeed at. Yeah. yeah. On a broader cultural level, you know, in, in the US, for example, you know, failure is almost a badge of honour for, for startups. What is it, do you think, about Australian culture that sees failure as a dirty word as opposed to a learning experience? Yeah, it's interesting because when we were, we were in the US recently, um, uh, a few startup founders and myself, and they were talking about you as a startup founder, you actually aren't successful until you failed. Yeah. So they celebrate that, and we don't do that here. And I just, I talk to people about failure, the only failure is not trying. So in my books, if you don't try, that's the fail. If, it, if you give it a go and it doesn't work, oh well, you've given it a go. But at a very early stage, we talk about not uh, and they're separating the person from the company, but at the early stage, you are the company, so it's really hard to separate it out. I think in Australia we have, you know, very high expectations of ourselves, but there's a little bit of pressure around tall poppies as well. So this is almost the reverse of that. So if you become too successful, we don't like that. We pull you down. If you're not successful enough, we don't like that. We want to pull you up. So it's, it's an interesting place to be. Um, I just stop listening to what everyone else says and try and focus on, you know, what's in here because that's ultimately what's going to get you through. It's hard, but that's, that's what I try to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> When your project has failed, what's the best way to find closure for that? To just put it on the shelf and walk away? Keep swimming. <laughs> 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 no, but, you know, there's so many great things you can work on out there, you know, and, like, it's always, like, if you fail with something, if you, you know, if you fail with your company or whatever, fail with your relationships, it's, you know, it's always, you always have a hard period, but there's a whole world out there. There's a whole sea full of fish or, well, so yeah. keep, keep, <laughs> keep swimming. Swim to your next project. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you, folks. We will be back soon with our third pitch and our panel will decide on the winner. But first, entrepreneurs are sometimes accused of swanning about the place. But if you look at swans beneath the water, they are paddling like a bastard, which is why sometimes you fall back to being an ugly duckling. So grab your favourite teddy as we bring you another startup bedtime story from the not cloned Alan Jones. <laughs> Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Don't you love the way narrative drives a great game like Overwatch? I've got a great story for you today. It's called The Nerdy Duckling. Once upon a time, there was a duckling who was the last of a brood to hatch from his mother's nest. He was ungainly and awkward, unlike all his brothers and sisters who enjoyed the outdoor life and took to water like, well, like ducks to water. The duckling found he was bad at water sports in fact, at all sports. In cricket, he scored ducks, not in a good way. At golf, he couldn't get close to a birdie. All the other ducklings teased him and called him nerdy. He grew despondent, and one night, while all the other ducks were sleeping off a big game of duck-duck-goose, he ran away from home. The nerdy duckling waddled far from his pond until it came to the city. But as he passed a pane of glass, he caught a glimpse of his reflection, a bunch of nerdy humans. They were wearing helmets and armed with video game controllers. On a large screen, ducks were exploding and the crowd cheered. The nerdy duckling charged into the eSports arcade. Are you hunting ducks as entertainment? He asked. 
The players admitted sheepishly that they were. Give me a go, he asked. And that nerdy duckling set a new high score, became the hero of the VR Duck Hunt 3D Championship. After no time at all, he went on to become a new darling of the esports set. And long after his fellow ducklings had had to retire from physical activity due to a buggered ACL, the nerdy duckling was continuing to smash it. And the moral of the story is that being an esports champion is a perfectly legitimate career choice, Mum, even for birds. The end. Now, it's time for bed, so take your device and pop under the covers, and I'll think you've gone to sleep. Good night. having shots tonight. <laughs> Our final picture is working on using technology to humanise rosters. Apparently that isn't a contradiction in terms. Please welcome John Webster. <laughs> G'day guys, my name's John and I'm the founder of Shifties. And Shifties is a service designed to humanise rosters. Now my wife's a nurse and she often comes home to sleep after a night duty only to be woken by her work trying to see if they can fit her in for an afternoon shift. There's no fatigue planning, no call list and the worst thing you can do for the health of a shift worker is mess with their sleep patterns. And she's not alone. In Australia, 40% of workers work either part-time or shift work. That's five million Australians whose work-life balance is in the hands of their employers to get right. And employers struggle too, because the software that's around to help them do this planning work goes through all sorts of complicated ways of scheduling people without actually asking the people. So Shifties turns that process on its head and we start with the employer and employee view of what a good shift looks like. Staff use connected devices to provide information about shifts that they'd prefer to work. And we take the lift for employers handling EBAs, legal problems, and all the other issues that they need so that we put the two together and build a roster that everybody can agree with. And studies show that giving staff a say in their work-life balance leads to happier staff, higher throughput, and lower staff turnover. Now, we've been testing our chops with Victoria Police on a collaborative research project to understand how to do this in real life. And we've just turned our product into a commercial release that's now being used in Australia. And we'd like to see more companies come on board and try and use this product with us. We believe we can save people a huge amount of time, not only in scheduling, but in giving staff a say in that work-life balance. We'd uh, like to invite you to join us on our website at shifties.com, where you can sign up to our Insiders program and find out a little bit more about what we do and watch us as we turn workforce planning into a human form around the world. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions for John? Um, maybe, like, what is the size of organization you're targeting here? Like, what's the minimum, maximum? So, uh, the smallest we've been working with at the moment is around 25 staff, but probably around sort of 15 if it's really complex. We've seen some, some businesses that have, like, really difficult shift planning, um, and, and we can make a difference there. Originally, we thought it'd be a much larger, but sort of 20, 25 is a sweet spot and up. What are your thoughts? I used to run a workforce planning team, so I love this because I would have loved to have this for my team. Um, from a user point of view, do the users get to input the times? How does it work from a user point of view? Yeah, so <laughs> users see a couple of things. Um, when the shifts are planned, they see what shifts that they're working on and they're colour coded so that it's pretty easy to see what they've been scheduled for. And then there's another view that they can click on that gives them the, the, the rosters in little boxes and they just tap on them once to say, I prefer not to work and twice to say, I don't want to be scheduled during that shift and then we'll bias the output accordingly. So it's pretty easy to use. Great. How about you, Megan? Um, on Following on from that, does it integrate with rostering software or is it a complete solution that you'd need? To it's a complete solution. So we, we do the solving as well. So we take all the rules, the EBAs, um, people can only work X number of a type of shift in 28 days and then they've got to have two days rest and all that stuff, plus the employee preferences as well. So if you want to take your kids out um, for footy on the weekend and you're doing oranges at half time, you can say just not that shift and we'll try and pop you around that and work around it for you. Give you a bit of work-life balance. Please join me in thanking John. Well, we're 
seen three incredible founders pitch inspirational companies tonight. So our judges are going to need some time to choose who goes through to our grand finale. In the meantime, have the audience hacked their way to a better life, Jess? Well, I hope you guys all enjoyed your smoothies, Ray. And we've nourished all of our brains back here on set. And we've actually compiled a really long list of life hacks to avoid burnout, especially around the startup space. So we've got startup hack number one for avoiding burnout is start your day with meditation. Oh yeah, I do that every morning. Next was take time for yourself. It isn't selfish. Absolutely. Third one, get some fresh air. Run around, exclamation mark underlined, <laughs> like a dog. <laughs> and remember your self-worth doesn't equal your achievements. I love that one, that's really important to remember. And the last life hack for avoiding burnout, fuel yourself with the good stuff, not drugs. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. I was thinking more like leafy greens, unprocessed foods. Anyway, that's all from us right now. But if you did want to access some more wellness tips and tips on how to have a healthy work-life balance or some healthy recipes, then subscribe to my YouTube channel, Study With Jess. And of course, take care of yourself. Cheers. And go to bed now. Well, not right now, because first it's back to you. Thanks, Jess. Okay, it is that time of the show. Our judges are about to announce the winner of the pitch ring. Who hit you in the sweet spot tonight? It was a hard decision, actually. We deliberated because there were three fantastic pitches solving three fantastic problems. So thank you very much, guys. But we have made a decision. Um, and we chose the pitch that we thought could have the greatest impact and a, a cause that we're all very, very passionate about. So congratulations to Rosie. Woo. <laughs> Congratulations, Rosie. You go in the running to compete in the grand finale where you could win some big prizes. And that is all we have time for. Please thank our pitchers and our panel. <laughs> Danielle Owen Whitford, Mikel Spain, and Megan Flamer. Next episode, we're going to look at civic tech. Is technology good for democracy or disrupting it? Or is that just a pile of fake news? See you then. Sandy, well done. How do you feel after tonight's pitch? Yeah, I feel great. Yeah, it was, um, it was in being in front of such an esteemed panel of judges, being alongside like a really good, a couple of amazing concepts and pitches. Um, it's inspiring and uh, yeah, more, more over enjoyable as well. Tell me, what's next for Shifties? So we've just released commercially, so we're, we're looking at um, selling a little bit more deeply into the market, building up a little bit of a customer base. Um, and early next year, we're going to open a, a round and look at uh, trying to raise uh, some more capital so that we can expand our works. Rosie, congrats, girl. How are you feeling? I'm totally buzzing. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually really moved that I was even invited to pitch alongside these legends and then, yeah, to take out that weird Unaroo thing. Um, yeah, it's very memorable. <laughs>